So, so welcome to, to today's session on forest finance investment track. Um, I think to some extent this session today is meant to leverage off uh, the two past sessions we had yesterday on the season finance. So there was the, those sessions set a very good background today. And um, what we have is the real thing set up today. Yeah. Really, first of all, painting what, what what is the current state of play regarding Ripping Frost and the Paris Agreement. We talked a lot about yesterday. What are the emerging trends in terms of the finance in the region? What are we seeing? Um, and also, what is the role of, of governments and the public sector in creating closer for engagement in the finance uh, forest and red? So, the, the, the morning we'll be speaking to um, into basically four sessions. The first session, which um, myself is going to talk to talk us through now, is, is mapping the motivation of the process of actors. We'll then have a short break. We'll then be, be looking at uh, what are some ideas and some innovative finance tools for, for protecting forests. We'll then be looking at, in the, in the next section, what are some of the pathways in which we can scale up the public sector engagement with forests. And then finally, we'll have some conclusions in the last 30 minutes or so. So, one of the things that's very important is we've asked the panelists to be fairly short and sharp in their presentation so that we can then. Um, have questions from the audience, and the moderator of the session will actually come off the stage and walk around uh, the room to try to get you to engage with. So please, I do encourage you very much. This is meant to be as best as we can facilitate an interactive session. If you've got ideas or thoughts, please, please don't um, don't hesitate. Coming so on that basis, I'll hand over to uh, to Marcel, who's going to kick off the first session. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, and welcome everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so we're going to have a look at uh, who the key players are in the private sector that invest in Red Plus and what actually drives them to invest in, uh, in forest landscapes and Red Plus projects. We're also going to look at the experiences of the private sector and what kind of uh, risks they are looking at, what kind of risks they're facing and the kind of returns that they are looking for. So uh, I'm not going to give a presentation now myself, but we've got, some, we've got four very distinguished panel members here uh, from the government uh, Iguami uh, and from uh, the investors, you can say, Bikram uh, and uh, Juan, and there is Ida Greenberry from the round table uh, Private sector roundtable in the Asian Pacific Rainforest Partnership. So I think I can start with Bikram to kick the session off with a, a brief presentation uh, dealing with these two questions. Uh, who are the key private uh, sector actors in Red Plus? What drives them? What are the experiences to date? And uh, what are the returns that they're looking for and the risks that they're facing? Hi, everybody. Hope you can hear me. So, my name is Vikram Chaudhary. Uh, you know, I am here on this panel as I guess talk about you know my experience as a, as a, a private investor. What we do is we we are in the business of connecting uh, you know the so-called impact investment space into into investment opportunities. Uh, you know, across the world. And prior to this, you know, I headed up the uh, impact investing practice in Credit Suisse, which is obviously a large Swiss bank, and at the forefront of, you know, a large number of, you know, initiatives in the impact investment space. So my investment experience, you know, extends kind of all the way from what we call the professional investors, what we in the business call real money, uh, all the way down to you know private individuals and family offices who tend to be you know private banking clients who also look for team based investing. And uh, well, in that respect, I have I guess you know a bit of uh, you know let's call it good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that uh, you know uh, there is still a lot of I think uh, a lot of uh, scope or potential for you know, Red Plus or even 
forest conservation to be an investable asset class. And I guess the bad news, if you were, is that there are a number of assets in the impact investing space that compete for that investment dollar or theme-based investing. So what and when I look at this space, I, you know, again, first of all, putting on my large institution hat, you know, having been in a financial institution for, for the best part of my career, one of the, you know, one of the striking aspects of this, you know, for example, this conference and, you know, a number of forums that people speak about conservation, conservation finance or green finance, is one, the lack of, I would say, private sector participation, which I think was pointed out yesterday by a number of people. And secondly, and to me the more glaring omission, is the lack of financial institution participation. Right. And in other words, the banks, you know, and obviously there are a number of, you know, what I would call national, uh, you know, investors, but in terms of the financial institutions, that typically would invest, for example, in an asset class to bring it to scale, uh, you know, finance debt, finance, you know, mezzanine, and sometimes even finance equity. Today, that dialogue, you know, is definitely lacking. And, and I think there is a strong need at the policy level to work together, you know, especially at the national level, to work together with colleagues in the banking supervision space at the respective jurisdictional levels. You know, banks are, you know, banks and financial institutions, for those of us who know it, it's stating the obvious, they are highly regulated institutions. And, and the regulatory framework that, you know, encompasses banks and FIs, to a certain extent, drives their commercial choices. So there's a interesting initiative on, in, for example, the European Union to, uh, to, to, to be able to provide guidelines around green finance and a number of the you know, aspects that are talking, they're talking about are as simple as providing capital concessions for investing in conservation projects and also asking banks to recognize environmental liabilities for lending to non-environment friendly projects, the concept of lending or liability, right? These are still in the, you know, the working group phase. But, you know, uh, just as an overview, you know, I think there are a number of things to be done here. And again, you know, to those who are in the policy making, you know, areas of the, of the uh, you know, of the space, I'd really urge you to form coalitions, specifically with, you know, for example, your, your Ministry of Finance and your banking regulators in the respective jurisdictions to understand how you can move it forward in tandem, you know, with the financial partners. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Big uh, Um Let's pass the mic to, uh, to Hua. Uh, on the other investment side, the public investment side, uh, GCF. So, Kuan, uh, what is your take on this? Uh, who are actually the key actors uh, who you would be servicing as GCF? Uh, how does the private sector come into that? Uh, and how are you using GCF money actually to de-risk their, ent their enterprise? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marcel, for the introduction. And uh, thank you everyone for being here in this session. So, uh, the GCF, we are still in a Actually, this presentation is for the later session, <laughs> where we will have a, a dynamics. So I will not talk much about this presentation, but in general, this year we are still in the early stage of engaging with private sector in the forest and animal sector. Uh, we have some uh, already approved projects that are working most in agriculture, but private sector and with the aim of reducing emissions from deforestation is still uh, an ongoing work that we have with some uh, entities that are our partners and our accredited entities to the fund. So what we are doing internally uh, is uh, developing some uh, potential guidance that's requested by the GCF board. In the next, the following board meeting in October, there will be a, a 
or document on how the GCF could engage with the private sector. Now, in this document, what we did is to analyze who are the actors that we're talking to. When we talk about private sector, we need to start identifying who they are. And if we look at the value chain in the, in the forest and energy sector, we have from producers, buyers, financial institutions, service providers, they are all private sector. Now, if we want to engage with the private sector, we will need to develop different kinds of instruments and, and structures that will be suitable for these different actors. For example, if we talk to a, a, a farmer, there needs to be, as a private sector actor, we need to, as a TCF, we can support them in order to uh, build their capacities to engage in a, in a, in a larger deals, like uh, um, strengthening their associations, for example. No, it's, it's, if you want to engage in a value chain of coffee, it's for having an impact that we are expecting to have as a TCF. We need to work with an association of farmers working on coffee and not with the individual themselves directly. So, in all this change, we are trying to develop different instruments for engaging with the private sector. Now, when we talk, with, we are already starting to talk with some of the investor sites. And there is indeed, as you know uh, very well, Red Plus is still something that has been already for many years under discussion, but at the scale that is needed, it's just starting in the recent years. We want to have Red Plus at the scale of national uh, or subnational levels at the trigger this pilot shift that we call in the GCF, we need to have significant investments from the private sector. But there, if we talk only about Red Plus, the, the, the experience that we have with at the project level, and what happened was that uh, there was no demand for what Red Plus was producing. So there was no incentive for the private sector. <coughs> what we're discussing now are potential structures on how to um, reduce those market risks that are perceived at the moment from private sector if they want to engage in Red Plus. Now, Red Plus is not only about the credits of the, or emission reduction that are generated, it's also about uh, the, the value chains of the commodities that in principle are the drivers of deforestation, but how do we turn them into uh, zero deforestation value chains? And that's an area that we're also trying to, uh, to work uh, in more detail this year, how we need to understand from the private sector what actually prevents them to, to have this zero deforestation value change. Where are the bottlenecks? Uh, many companies have uh, made pledges of zero deforestation value change, but according to recent reports, that's likely not going to, they are not going to make, meet their commitments by 2020, as they were uh, uh, promising in, in the New York Declaration of Forest, for example. But what actually is happening? Why is not that materialized? Uh, so there are many, Additional elements that are not purely private sector reducing risk, but it's also the enabling conditions that need to happen for, for them to, to fulfill those targets. I'm very happy to discuss the, the later session. I have made a presentation on that, and it will be uh, great to, to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Juan. Uh, so, from the investment side, we now have a picture uh, that there is actually a lack of uh, involvement of, uh, of private sector, there's a lack of financial institutions that are, that are involved, not just in doing, but even in policy making, uh, they need to be engaged. Uh, and uh, uh, from the, the, the public uh, finance side, there's a need to, or there's an identified need to turn producers into uh, collaborators for stopping deforestation, maybe even investment in restoration. How do you do that? Uh, uh, how can you incentivize that? I think there's a, uh, a key role here for the private sector to take initiative itself. There's a key role for government. So I'll turn to, uh, to Ida. Ida, can you give us a brief on what would drive the uh, private sector to invest in Red Plus, to become an active uh, engager in this? Uh, what do they need to, uh, to help them actually to do this in such a way that it also provides a proper return, what, and what kind of returns are they looking for? Thanks, Mark, for this uh, perfect introduction. I have some pres presentation to present while talking for five minutes, and I don't like you know, putting my back on the presentation. Can you play the presentation, please? Thank you. So, my name is Aida Grimbury. I've been uh, uh, working as a chair of private sector roundtable for Asia Pacific 
Red Fox Scholarship for two years, more or less. So, next slide, please. Um, so let's just start by presenting some facts. I think you haven't touched this before. And um, as you can see from the screen, um, the first, let's talk about the, the cost of deforestation in the tropics. You know, it's uh, forestry and agricultural industry drive at least two thirds of tropical deforestation uh, globally. And 447 global companies made public commitments to address the commodity driven deforestation. Although, as you all pointed out quite a bit before, there's some um, questions about whether they can actually complete their commitment or implement a commitment or not. Uh, global greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and forestry is about 24%, and tropical deforestation accounts for about 15% of the world's global warming pollution. Meanwhile, according to Woods Hole Research, we need to halt deforestation and restore 500 million hectares of tropical forest if we are to meet Paris Agreement of staying under 1.5 degrees. So these are the facts as a background information. Uh, next slide. And let's see what the private sectors have been doing. Uh, the last eight years, we have seen a transformation in the global commodity supply chain towards breaking the link with deforestation. There's now a broad global agreement between companies, research institutions, conservation and environmental NGOs, governments and forest dependent, dependent communities that tropical deforestation need to be stopped. For many years, they have been committed to the protection of high conservation value forests, or um, a lot of people refer to that as ACVs. However, however, secondary forests that provide essential carbon storage, habitat for biodiversity and forest products, with basically what zero deforestation means were not protected back then, in 2011. So, next. A forest conservation initiative was born in 2011. The initiative, many refer it as high carbon stock approach, uh, created a global methodology for land use planning that is to distinguish forest in humid tropics areas for protection from degraded lands with low carbon and biodiversity values that may be developed. I'll talk more about that later. If you go to the next slide. So, why the approach? Why the high carbon stock approach? First, is practical methodology based on latest science. Uh, in my pre previous uh, role as the managing director of Asia Public Member Group, I've seen with my own eyes how practical it was being implemented on the ground. And second, is now an integrated process. It's an integrated process between high carbon stock approach, uh, protection, high conservation value protection, and implementation of FPIC. So instead of doing multi assessments in, uh, in a concessions or in, a, in a ecosystem restoration areas, whatever, you only just do one assessment to ensure that biodiversity and high carbon stock and community rights are protected. And thirdly, it's adaptive, it's evolving, um, 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 expanding horizons, it's expanding to different commodities and different regions right now, and also it's scientifically always evolving uh, based on the latest science in forest conservation. But most importantly, it has multi-stakeholder governance and oversight of the methodology. The members of the high carbon stock approach consisting of conservation uh, uh, organizations, scientists, um, producers, and also technical experts. So the, the decisions that we reach inside the initiative is uh, based on consensus level from these multi-stakeholders. Next, please. So the methodology to implement zero deforestation is already there, but how much does it actually cost? So, based on my own experience and uh, several uh, benchmark studies, in the tropics, forest conservation costs about $20 to $100, depending on the region and level of threats. And for a full restoration, it's about $1,000 to $2,000, depending on the soil condition. This excludes the uh, opportunity cost. And currently, the responsibility for conserving and protecting these areas is largely within the producer country and the associated organizations and communities. Um, 
We must also remember that forest conservation does not recognize boundaries. That means that each concession can just implement this methodology themselves without looking at the, the, the full landscape. And this is thankfully has been supported by the government of Indonesia with the issuance of the DG regulations on high conservation values areas of high carbon stock forest that was issued in 2017. So the instrument by the government thankfully is really there to, to, to help us to achieve that. And, um, but what is missing on this list is basically the consumer good manufacturers, brands, retailers and buyers. What they do to conserve forests? What have they done? Probably just one or two million dollars uh, as part of the CSR is generally not enough to conserve forests in the tropics where a lot of these brands and good, uh, good manufacturers and brands retailer, retailers actually make a huge profit in the last century from the tropics. Next slide, please. Um, forest conservation and finance require enabling conditions and necessary um, instruments. Um, we are very, very happy that the, the government uh, has issued government regulation number 46. Basically, um, a government on economic instruments in environmental matters, where um, nat national uh, balance sheet for natural capital and also environmental funding um, mechanism have been recognized and also part of the regulations. That's the next step to move forward to achieve our goal. Next slide. But we must also not forget the fiscal transfer mechanism, uh, which some say has been proven positive in India, increasing 1% of their uh, forest cover. And Indonesia also want to have a look at the same thing. So, next slide, please. In December 2017, Indonesian government and the Ministry of Finance has issued Finance Finance Minister Regulations number 230, where it regulates the implementation of, uh, of um, uh, fiscal transfer. It's still being rolled out, so the implementation is not yet consistent throughout the nation properly. This is where we need to help the government to implement this properly. In summary, in conclusion, we need we need the following partners to collaborate in forest conservation and finance with clear roles and respons responsibility. From private sectors, we have two types, producers and users. Producers, um, um, they need to protect their own forest and address the uh, legacy of deforestation in the past in their own concessions, their own operations and the surrounding landscapes. For users, they need to start addressing their deforestation footprint in the past and also support forest conservation in their supply chain and the surrounding landscapes. Uh, it is very important that we need an uncomfortable zero deforestation or uh, no deforestation or NDPE, some people call it no deforestation, no, no feed and no exploitation platform to link between supply chain to the forest through direct intervention at the community level and to collaborate with partners in landscape to achieve a nested ecosystem approach. The key principles of this platform that probably need to be established because I have not yet seen any, any platform exist until now is basically you need to be credible, uh, multi-stakeholder governance, free of conflict of interest, profit, achieving performance and results on the ground, equitable sharing of the forest and support the government commitments to greenhouse gas emission reduction and NDC. So it's very important to work very closely with government uh, as well. Perfect, the government of course need to has, has been have established their instruments to allocate a national budget for fiscal transfer, for example, and then of course uh, working with uh, payment for ecosystem services and government. After all, forest conservation is a good responsibility. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Marcel. So this shows that there actually is a lot of uh, a lot of private sector interest to engage. There are already platforms established to engage to set uh, joint targets. Uh, there's a lot of uh, collaboration between the producers, but the lack of involvement of downstream industry. Um, but still, uh, the results so far is that uh, only 50% of industry is engaged, the other 50% continue in business as usual and that means the continuation of deforestation uh, with uh, in a uh, non-level playing field. So where these industries
industries might actually get a bit more profits than the industry that's trying to do uh, a responsible business. So it clearly is a role for another key stakeholder in its government. And uh, I would like to uh, ask Ibo Ami to give us an overview of how the government sees this playing field of industry and what are you doing as government to incentivize the actors and to, to uh, de-risk the, the entrepreneurs that are daring enough to take a role in uh, uh, achieving the NDC, uh, the policy target of the government itself. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcel. And first of all, I would like to thank the uh, organizer for having me here. Uh, at this very important, timely important sessions. As a timely, timely important because a regime of finance, investment and trade could play a very significant uh, role and should play a more active role in responding uh, to the current environmental challenges. I have three slides uh, to, to help me in uh, describing uh, the role of government of Indonesia in this context. Uh, in uh, motivate or incentivize uh, various stakeholders in moving toward the uh, sustainable financing to the environment. May I have my presentation, please? No, not this one. This is not my presentation. Uh, okay. okay, can I have the right one, please? <laughs> because I only have one. I don't send the false one. Uh, by the way, uh, Ibu Aida has mentioned about the government regulation number 46, 2017. Indeed, the uh, government regulation is one of the uh, initiative, a policy initiative has been done by the government of Indonesia. Uh, yeah, by the way, my name is Laxmi and Abi is my nickname. So, uh, please call me Laxmi. Uh, we start our Environmental Protection and Management Act uh, back in 1982 and we renewed the Act on 1987, 1997 uh, but in, again in uh, 2009 we have a new Act on Environmental Protection and uh, Management but based on the past experiences uh, there was not only a lack of awareness that are facing by all the stakeholders. Indeed, there is also a lack of other instruments, not only technical regulation, but also economic instrument. That's why back 10 years ago, we thought that it is, it is a must for, for government of Indonesia to draw a schemes or a, a, a complete picture of how government should uh, incentivize and, and uh, push the motivation all stakeholders. So this is the overview, if you can see. Uh, but basically, we would like to, to push or to move all the um, many resources towards sustainable financing for the environment, including the forest conservation. And there are three big groups, uh, if I would explain to you. The first group is, uh, this, is this one is the uh, group of, uh, well, the uh, orange one. The orange one is a group of uh, set of incentive mechanisms uh, set by the government. The green one, uh, government need to also assist or to to uh, what you call it, to drive the creation of market toward the sustainable um, financing. And the third one, it is also important how to have a better management a good governance in all this kind of uh, economic instrument. And there are, uh, the, these three groups are uh, continuing inspiring our uh, government, regul uh, government officer to really put this idea into the regulation. And then, uh, only last year, after eight years of uh, preparing the draft, we uh, finally, uh, come up with the new regulation, government regulation number 48, year 2015. And we categorize the economic instrument, we call it an economic instrument. Uh, initially, we would like to call it as a market-based instrument, but then the parliament and government agreed to use economic instrument for this uh, set of instrument. So there are three categories, instrument for planning, it's basically to uh, 
as corrective actions to internalize the externalities because we've been we've been forgotten the externalities uh, for decades. So we need to internalize the externalities. So it's kind of a correction, act, uh, corrective action to our development planning process. And the second groups is in, uh, in fast, uh, instrument for financing. Indeed, financing is very important. Everybody is talking about financing nowadays. Uh, yesterday we heard how to finance the NDCs. Today we're going. We are talking about again uh, finance. Uh, how to finance the uh, uh, forest uh, protections uh, activities. And the third one is incentive. So basically, this uh, uh, instrument are not really only providing uh, money or providing finance or making them easier way to do the business. But the more important thing is to change the behaviors, behavior of all the stakeholders. We need to have a new type of behavior towards uh, our development uh, uh, process. So the behavior that lowering the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission, behavior to lowering the loss of biodiversity, behavior to base our plan based on the carrying capacity of the ecosystem, that kind of uh, changing behavior that we would like to have by implementing this instrument. So, uh, as a wider practice, I, I could put those instruments in this chart. So, uh, this regulations, uh, well, um, you may agree, uh, argue that this regulation is too ambitious, but honestly, we had, don't have any other choice rather than ambitious because we've been like so many things uh, uh, for decades. So it is a time to correct our uh, behavior, to correct our policy, to correct our uh, way to do the business. So we try to put all the, uh, the needs into a frame. And the uh, government regulation 48, 2017, is really a regulatory framework. This government regulation cannot be implemented as a uh, single regulation it has to be followed by sets of regulations, standards, uh, and um, many, many uh, what you call it procedures, uh, guidelines, and that kind of things. And I could share with you that although it's only it's still less a year in, in our age, but uh, because we. Uh, prepare this government regulation since 2000, back nine, eight years ago. So all the, uh, uh, some, some uh, guidelines, uh, uh, different regulations are already there. For example, the OJK Financial Services uh, Regular Authority has been has launched two important initiative policy. One is on, on the sustainable financing. Second one is uh, regarding the green bond. It's because of this re a frame, a regulatory framework. And uh, to better the, the uh, financial um, financing initiative toward the economic, uh, toward the ecosystems, uh, the government of uh, Indonesia is now preparing a draft of presidential decree on establishing the BLU by the Layanan uh, Umum. It's a public service unit owned by government to manage the environmental fund in more flexible and uh, include various of schemes, various of uh, type of instrument uh, on environmental financing. So I think uh, by having said that, I just would like to underline that government of Indonesia, uh, and I believe other government as well, it's, it's, it's a belief that we need to have all stakeholders on board to do uh, toward the sustainable development, especially in terms of the uh, forest conservation. But as a policymaker, government could play a very significant role in uh, set the standard, in set the regulation, to have everybody, all the stakeholders, uh, will likely to do uh, hand in hand in doing a good effort toward the uh, sustainable development um, policy. Uh, thank you. I think that's all my uh, my share to this uh, important uh, discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's a lot of frameworks put in place already by government now uh, that would help to facilitate actually to 
come that it's for the institutes to become active, to be a uh, private sector to engage. But at the moment, it's still frameworks, it's largely theory. If I may be a little bit uh, uh, devious, how do we get it to actually operate? What will it take? Um, now, rather than going back now myself with this question to the panel members, I would like to open up to the floor for you guys, because you're, I'm sure, you're very impatient. We've seen that 50% of the industry is already active, uh, wanting to engage in this field, and they're already engaged in this field, but they need support. So what are the steps that would need to be taken by government? What are the steps that should be taken by private sector to actually take these frameworks that have been established by the government, to take that forward into practical action? I think that's uh, what we're going to look at uh, throughout the day, but maybe we can get a feel for it ideas that are living in the, in the crowd here, in the audience. So, who would uh, want to ask a question or, or make a comment in this regard? Yes, please. I'll, I'll start with the first uh, hand here. Uh, and I'll walk around. You know? I'm a private sector businessman. <coughs> I have $10 million to invest in forests and I want my money to go towards maximum conservation of the forest tomorrow. I want a return of between 5 and 20% on my money, averaged over 10 years. What do I do? I'll take a few more questions before we start answering. You see, I only see men. I always go for gender balance here, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Yes. Hi. Uh, my question is more of an open <coughs> question because we never talked about technology specifically, and I'm wondering where the costs are. So, if the funding is a generic issue, or do we know how it breaks down operationally? <coughs> so, on the field, protecting the forest, being there, and compared to monitoring. And how technology is still an obstacle or not? Like the cost of processes in this case. Thank you. One step further here. Okay, thank you. I have two questions. Oh yeah, my name is Mani from Universitas uh, Andalas Padang, West Sumatra. I have two questions actually. The first is, rather than uh, giving more opportunities for private sectors, in its uh, natural resource uh, explorations, we have to regulate that. Don't come directly, because when you come directly to the field, you will uh, produce conflict with the local communities. It is better you to, to make a fair trade and uh, giving them to work more on added value rather than uh, work directly on the field. And then the second question uh, go, go to uh, Ami. Uh, as our experience, that when we have new regulation, we take time to synchronize with other regulation, and we need more operational regulation, right? And that's uh, how long we need time to get uh, the real benefit from the government regulation number 46, 2017. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the land are public lands for the public purposes. So, actually, related to the private sector, what kind of the equity the private sector is looking for? Do you need to privatize the all the public land to attract your investment? As it is from conservation function. Okay, let's uh, answer these four questions first. Uh, I would like to start uh, from the panel. Ladies first, all right then. For Ibu Ami. Would you like to start, yeah? So government first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, there's, there's only one specific question to me, but uh, allow me to, to also answer the uh, open questions regarding the panel. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I only uh, focused my presentation on 
fiscal and, and financial instrument because uh, because we're according to the TOR of the session. But yes, you're, you're uh, right that technology is still a challenge, uh, especially in Indonesia, and especially for the uh, uh, small and medium, uh, micro, small and medium enterprises. Uh, what government do in, in dealing with these challenges is we uh, we develop a set of uh, uh, another incentive. For example, uh, we uh, we develop the uh, what you call it the pool of information, a pool of technology information, so that the SME could easily find uh, a proper technology that that may be a fit uh, to their activities. We also uh, uh, develop so-called environmental technology verification. So, for example, if one this is mainly incentive for the technology developer, if they have a new technology and they 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 simply have no uh, 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 capability to go to the, the third certification body, for example, they they can go to the office and then ask uh, ask to facilitate. Uh, they they will. Uh, they will explain their technology. It's kind of the uh, self-declared. So we develop the self, uh, self-declared environmental technology. Uh, in, in uh, to my knowledge, other colleagues at other ministries, for for example, Ministry of Industry, they also have kind of incentive to lower the cost uh, of technology. Again, it is for the small and medium enterprises because uh, the government. Uh, Government uh, resources is always not limited, so we focus our, our effort in uh, to incentivize the uh, micro, small, and medium uh, enterprises. Uh, the question regarding uh, when likely will we benefit for the regulation number forty six two thousand and seventeen? Basically, indeed, indeed, it is a new regulation. But if you if you uh, uh, go into the more uh, 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 what you call it uh, review on the uh, various uh, instrument, there are a lot of instrument that has been there in the field. For example, the uh, green GDP done by the local government, payment for ecological services, uh, environmental labeling, they are all already there. This. Uh, there are only a limited new instrument uh, uh, promoted by this regulation. But other, I mean, for other uh, existing regulations, this government regulation is basically to speed up and to improve the, the ongoing one. Um, so far, we already implement uh, the government regulation uh, as it is uh, launched, but only two instruments that takes uh, according to the, uh, the mandate, we only have two years to develop. One is environmental performance deposit fund, and uh, because it, we, we need to harmonize because no days Ministry of Energy and Mining Resources already have that regulation. Another ministry already have that regulation. We need to harmonize, but we only have two years to do so. But for the the other instrument. Um, you may find the guidelines already, you may find the information, you may find the case of best practices of the, uh, uh, the instrument, it's already there. So uh, I believe and I'm sure that the, this government regulation is already ready to implement. Um, before going to uh, Buaida, uh, there was a question uh, about somebody who was very impatient, sitting there on 10 million dollars and uh, not knowing how to actually get this operationalized here in Indonesia. Um, so what, the, the question is actually for open, what is the advice for this person, uh, both from the Indonesian government but also for instance from GCF and from uh, the impact of that side, what could he do with the stand in the current policy environment? Okay. Um uh, we don't we don't have yet the uh, the value as I mentioned. If the value, I mean the institution that we would like to establish is already there, you can put your money into that that institution. But I would rather uh, uh, suggest you to go to because as uh, I mentioned about the uh, initiative done by the OJK, Autoritas Jasa Keuangan Financial Services 
uh, authority, they already uh, have two uh, innovative policy, one is sustainable financing and the other one in green bond. As regard to the sustainable financing, since two years ago, they already have the first attempt, uh, they call it first movers, that include eight banks. So you can go and to that bank and join with the first movers of the OJK to invest your, your money. But, uh, part of that, you may also go to the, uh, the uh, we call it uh, Kelompok Philanthropy Indonesia, Indonesian Philanthropy Association. Go to that association and invest your money and they will put your money in a very proper way, in a proper um, uh, objective as well. Thank you. Uh, Huang, uh, what would you as ECF uh, say to such an uh, investor and uh, can you help him? <laughs>
the, uh, the more theoretical framework to, to help the industry to, to move forward. Yes, thank you. I forgot to say thank you to the organizers before for arranging a gender balance panelist today. Um, for the just the ten million dollars thing, uh, for the for the private sector's point of view, uh, our priority right now is not about making money from forest conservation. Our priority is now basically ensuring sustainable supply chain. So that's from the uh, producers and users' point of view. How can we uh, conserve forests while investing in the forest to ensure that our supply chain will be sustainable? The palm oil, the palm wood, the cocoa, the, the rubber, everything else will be sustainable. So I'm not going to too much about the tender at all. And um, regarding the general questions about funding, um, uh, a question about operation and implementation. So from the private sector side, uh, we, we split the implementation and the operations into two, the producer side and the uh, um, uh, uh, community. In the, in, in the producer's country, we split into two, the producers and the uh, community, and it's, uh, community institutions, and also experts. So I don't know um, if you understand this split. Um, on the monitoring side, uh, there's no such technology uh, we have right now that can actually be 100% bulletproof. So again, ground verification, verification is always needed. So the implementation team have to be strong enough. And also we can also use the, 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 the NGOs to, to help monitor what's going on on the ground. Um, uh, regarding what we need from the private sector, Marcel, I think we need uh, the instruments already there. Thank you very much for the government. Uh, we, we, we need more supporting regulations from other ministries, uh, uh, you know, supporting regulations from other Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Agriculture, and others, and also on the enforcement side. So uh, uh, these regulations need to be enforced and implemented by the stakeholders and producers. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, all the panel members. Uh, uh, I think we've come to the end of this uh, of this session. Obviously, we won't be able to answer all questions or deal with all the issues, but I hope this has given you a bit of an overview of uh, what is out there in terms of uh, questions, in terms of uh, issues that the private sector is looking at, uh, the issues uh, and solutions that are being considered by government, uh, the frameworks that have been put in place both on the private sector side as well as the, the government side. We're going to uh, look further into this in the, the next sessions uh, today. So I hope you all stay and hope more people will join even. Uh, and uh, then we will be going for a break now. Um, so I think I'm eating already five minutes into the break. So I, will, uh, I will keep it at this. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to seeing you later.